All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live look into Autism Solutions. My name is Jim Moore. I'm the Director of Autism Solutions here at Canopy. And I wanted to spend some time with everyone today just to kind of talk about what's going on in Autism Solutions and then also answer any questions that you may have. So um, as most of you may have here in the Jackson area may know, we have um, been in our Center of Excellence location on Lakeland Drive for several months now. And we are now actively enrolling new children in that program thanks to the recent addition of five new uh, behavior technicians here in the Jackson area. So we're really excited to have five new registered behavior technicians on staff to go along with our outstanding collection of five board certified behavior analysts here in this location. We're also about to admit our first clients in our Hattiesburg location. We have three registered behavior technicians that just passed their exam to go along with our two outstanding uh, board certified behavior analysts. So we're really excited and we hope to just continue this momentum so that we can serve more and more children and families on the autism spectrum. Pretty soon you'll be seeing some news about a second location that we'll be launching here in Jackson. More details to come on that in the coming months. Uh, but we wanted to just kind of get you up to, up, up to speed on what's going on. We have the largest applied behavior analytic team here in, the, in Mississippi, nine board certified behavior analysts, all licensed here in the state of Mississippi. We're now up to, I believe, 21 registered behavior technicians. Uh, so we're about to continue bringing folks on. So if you're thinking about a career in a field like behavior analysis, or maybe you just want to help children with autism, go to mycanopy.org and look for the positions that we have listed on our website, both for the Jackson area and Hattiesburg. If you're a parent of a child with autism under the age of eight looking for early intensive behavioral services, also go to our website or you can call our 1-800 number, which is on our website, and we'll lo would love to get you plugged into the outstanding things that are going on. So some recent news, our, uh, the manager of our Center of Excellence here in Jackson, Dr. Chris Furlow, was recently awarded a mini grant from the Developmental Disabilities Conference, our council. We're really excited about that because what that will do is it will allow us to offer parent training workshops for parents of children with autism who are on waiting lists and also some families of children with other developmental disabilities where we'll be offering our foundational parent training series. Uh, we'll have more details of that coming out, but it's also going to send our BCBA team to Chicago this May to attend the Association for Behavior Analysis International's annual convention so that they can see the most cutting edge practices and parent training presented right there at the conference. So we're extraordinarily excited. I want to wish uh, Dr. Furlow and his team congratulations on that award. And hopefully we'll be getting more information out to the community very soon about that parent training series. So um, I'm going to open it up. We have a few people here. If, we, if you have questions about Autism Solutions, the program, or about anything uh, general to autism or applied behavior analysis, I would love to answer those questions now and do what I can. Got a few folks here. Got... See, we have some folks typing some questions. So while we're waiting for a question to come through, why don't we talk a little bit about applied behavior analysis because you hear a lot about autism and what we provide here at Canopy right now uh, is applied behavior analysis therapy, which has been shown as the gold standard for early intensive intervention for children with autism. It's based on natural science principles, which people say, what's well, natural science? Well, you have natural science and you have social science. Social science practiced by psychologists and social workers, counselors uh, with specific tools, which are all outstanding in their own right. Behavior analysis wants to be more like physics and chemistry, computer science, where we try to measure everything based off of 
uh, the smallest measurable unit, which we say is a single behavior. So it's not really that we believe that we're right and everyone else is wrong. It's that we take a very different approach. So we define everything as either behavior or part of the environment, including those things that are internal to the individual or what our founder V.F. Skinner said were inside our skin, within our skin. So this is based off of learning theory, lots of observation, lots of data collection. And we try to find what we say are the functional properties that will either make uh, challenging behavior decrease so that we can get more uh, adaptive behaviors going, or what functional properties are needed to make an adaptive behavior, uh, such as speaking with vocal speech, or learning to tie their shoes, or to match colors, or to you know re even read. What are those functional properties that will help support those behaviors? So our standard kid will come in for 25 to 35 hours a week for intensive therapy. So we have some children that stay with us all day long. They nap with us, they eat with us, and then the rest of their day is therapy where we're seeing some incredible gains. What's awesome about working in this field with early intensive intervention uh, is we often get the privilege of seeing a ch being there when a child uh, produces his or her first vocal speech, uh, which is usually to request something that they want. And then to see that kind of start to cascade and build exponentially into whole vocabularies of words uh, and then eventually conversation. It's really, really a privilege to get to do that work. And the principles of applied behavior analysis really put us in the best position because unlike 25 years ago when I went through graduate school where most of the thinking was that autism blocked the ability for an individual to speak, what we tend to believe now is that for many of these children, we're not dealing with a skill deficit, we're dealing with what's called a motivation deficit, or in layman's terms, a won't do problem for whatever reason. The things in the world that motivate us to use words are not sufficiently motivating for these individuals. It never ceases to amaze me as long as I've been doing this to see a child give you their first words and then just an explosion where there's absolutely nothing you can tell was really wrong with their ability to speak. They're very articulate uh, and the words start to really, really flow. Now, some of our children do have other issues. Some of them do have problems with articulating speech. Maybe their tongue isn't quite coordinating the way it should. They may have a condition called apraxia, but we can work with other professionals in other fields, such as speech language pathology, occupational therapy, and really start to see those children make lots of progress. So I'm gonna open it back up to some questions. We have a, a, a good but very quiet audience so far. Um, so whatever questions you may answer, we're, we're ready to, to sit here and talk about it. But I'm also really excited over the coming weeks and months for you to start meeting the members of our team. You'll start to meet through social media, the awesome team of behavior analysts that we have at Canopy, and then uh, all the way to some of our really outstanding and caring and compassionate behavior technicians. It's a team that has to deliver this therapy. Uh, the BCBA can't be in every single session. Uh, so the therapy is delivered mainly by behavior technicians. They're registered behavior technicians. Uh, registered uh, by the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, and then they're also registered with the State Licensure Board and supervised directly by a behavior analyst for, in our clinic, at least 10% of the time that the child receives therapy. So we have, again, an outstanding team. It's a large team. It continues to grow, uh, and hopefully we'll start to see the ability to even provide treatment outside of our walls, such as in homes or in community settings, start to increase as well. So far, no questions. I know Ellery has a question. She's online and always is a plethora of good questions. 
questions about our team, questions about me, about autism solutions, about applied behavior analysis. We're open for just about any of them. So there are questions. I just can't see them apparently. All right, so Tori asks, I go to school at USM in Hattiesburg and I'm really interested in becoming an RBT and working with Canopy in the Hattiesburg region. I was wondering if there, if the training will be offered at the facility prior to being hired, how does the whole process getting registered, certified to become an RBT work? Well, Tori, that's an outstanding question. Uh, and we are hiring in Hattiesburg. If you go to mycanopy.org and click on careers, you'll see a position for behavior, um, behavior technician in uh, the Hattiesburg area. Make sure you apply for the one in Hattiesburg and not in Jackson. And currently we do provide that training. We're hoping as the offerings at the community college level continue to expand, for example, I have a meeting coming up soon with Dr. Jana Causey and Dr. Adam Brewwood from Pearl River Community College about offering that course um, on the Hattiesburg campus uh, for folks there. But for now, we do offer that. So once you're hired, there are three things you have to do to become a registered behavior technician. One, you have to finish a 40-hour course that have specific uh, educational goals that come from what's called the Registered Behavior Technician Task List. You can find that task list at BACB.com and we offer that course. It's an online course you take with us. It's one of the first things you do when you're employed at Canopy. So it's 40 hours. You usually We usually break it up into two weeks for our people because while you're doing the coursework, we're also getting you toward the second requirement which is passing the competency assessment. From that, there's 13 items on the competency assessment that you have to demonstrate that you can do proficiently. And a lot of that comes through our training model, which is a direct behavioral skills based model, where we tell you what to do, show you what to do, give you feedback in doing that. So we like to integrate those two trainings. So you'll spend about half of your first day in the 40 hour coursework and in the other half of the day with clients, um, getting your hands in there and getting some feedback. And so once you have finished your 40 hours, passed the competency assessment, then you sit for a national exam, which has about an 87% pass rate. Um, and then once you pass that, you're a registered behavior technician, we register you with the state board and then you are ready to go. Have some other questions? I'm not able to see them. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Sarah has a question. What might I start? When may, may might I start seeing signs of autism in my child? What are the most common signs early on? Um, Florida State University has published a screening instrument recently where they have found they can accurately identify signs of autism around 18 months. There are some researchers out there making claims that they can start picking up on some of the symptoms even earlier. Now, you have to remember we're dealing with a very wide spectrum. Uh, includes a wide spectrum of severity. Some children are more impacted than others. 
uh, I would say that the type one autism or the what's some unfortunately called higher functioning autism used to be Asperger's is probably the hardest one to identify because those children usually don't show as many delays in um, expressive language. But in general, what you want to be looking for are, are uh, if your child does not respond to sound in a way that seems typical, maybe they don't respond at all. Maybe they overly respond to that. Or, and especially if they don't respond to their name. I think one of the first things that I would do as a parent is schedule two appointments. Well, I'd schedule the first appointment with my child's uh, pediatrician. And then I would ask about a referral to an ear, nose, and throat specialist so that I could have my child seen by an audiologist just to make sure that I'm not dealing with issues with hearing. Uh, once my child has uh, shown that there aren't any um, hearing issues, then probably the next thing we would want to do is fill out a screening document called the MCHAT which is an empirically verified screen. It's not a diagnostic tool, but it's a screening document to show if it's, it may be useful to go through a diagnostic evaluation. Some other things, if the child doesn't show emotion in a way that we might expect from a typical two-year-old, especially toward his or her caregivers, then I would be, uh, I would at least want to ask those questions. The best place to ask those questions is at the two-year-old well checkup visit, if not before. Uh, your pediatrician, depending on when your pediatrician was trained, may be very open to that. They may push back, and as a parent, you can push right back and say, no, I don't believe it's just that my child is shy or introverted. Uh, I believe that I would like to at least look at something like the MCHAT and see if we might be, you know, in need of a diagnostic. A, di a diagnostic evaluation doesn't mean you leave the diagnosis. It's a way to see if we might, because what we know is if we can find autism as early as possible, the prognosis and the outcomes are much better than if we catch it much later. So excellent question. All right. So we have a question from Ellery. Does insurance cover autism treatment? Well, that depends. In the state of Mississippi, they, they're supposed to. We, thanks to the leadership of our current Secretary of State, Delbert Hoseman, uh, and Representative Steve Massengale and Senator Rita Parks in our legislature, in 2015, Governor Bryant signed into law House Bill 885, which did two things. It mandated coverage of uh, services, insurance coverage for services for autism, specifically applied behavior analysis. And it also created a license and a licensure board. So it's both what's called a practice act uh, and a title act, meaning you have to have the license to practice and call yourself a behavior analyst in Mississippi. So except in some very rare small business cases, if you provide insurance in Mississippi, then yes, you have to cover this treatment. If you have questions about that, the first place to, to start is with your insurance provider. But then also, if you Google Mississippi Department of Insurance, there's a link on the, the Insurance Commission's webpage specifically for autism. There's questions and answers. There's a hotline you can call if you, if you feel like you're not getting the answers to your questions. Uh, now, when I say it depends, our, our friends in the insurance uh, business right now may put some limitations on that coverage that might mean that the, your child may not get what is absolutely medically necessary. Hopefully they will. And each payer is slightly different. So again, start with your insurance company and then go to the uh, insurance commission's website and click on that link to find out more. All right, next question. So I have a friend whose child was recently diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. How do I support her? What do you recommend close friends and family do to help? I think that the, that's a really good question. I think one of the most important things is just to be understanding. And one of the things that as a professional and as a parent, I've noticed in working 
with this population is it reminds me of another group of children I worked with early in my career and uh, children with traumatic brain injury, meaning that when I would meet with those families, there was this overwhelming sense of loss. Um, and what I hope that we can help, just, so, so sometimes it's, it's just important to let parents just kind of experience that and not really put any kind of value judgment on it. Just let them go through that, that, that experience. And then what they'll inevitably see is I've, I've seen, I've been just blessed to work with some of the most outstanding parents ever that are going to do move mountains for their child. We have families here in the Jackson clinic who have literally moved from out of state and across state so that their child can have access uh, to services. I think one of the biggest things is just to be supportive. You know, you can learn, I'll tell you, one of the best things, and it might sound a little odd, learn what you can do to be a good babysitter. You know, let the parents get out and have a little bit of a life away from their child. That's okay. It's okay to go out and have fun with, and, and let your child with autism stay with someone else. Um, and then just be a good accepting ear. They're going to go through a wash of guilt and anxiety and frustration um they're gonna they're gonna be trying to find whose fault is this it's no one's fault we don't even know what's causing autism to be honest so just to be a good support mechanism to just let them know that they're not bad parents they're not bad people they didn't do anything to cause this and just support them however you can through the solution there'll they'll be a lot if you're a, a a sciencey type person educating yourself on the best science that we know about autism treatment because there is a lot of pseudoscience out there and parents are just looking for hope and unfortunately some folks out there are packaging a wrapping paper that labeled hope and parents are just trying their they just want to see something you know help their child so if you can look at things objectively and, and help a parent navigate this sea of information related to autism, I think that would be a tremendous service to that family. All right, we have another one? So April asked, uh, um, do we offer school services for nine-year-olds. Well, we do in Hattiesburg and Jackson. We, we did have an outstanding day school program with a thriving autism classroom on the Gulf Coast in Gulfport. Uh, and we were unable to keep that going because we couldn't find an administrator. But we would, we, there are a tremendous number of really, really good behavior analysts on the Gulf Coast. And uh, I would be more than happy if that's where you live. I'm assuming if your child was at the Long Beach Autism Project that you're from the Gulf Coast. And uh, I'd be happy to help you get connected to one of those outstanding service providers on the Gulf Coast. So we have some folks uh, letting us know that we've done a good job. We appreciate that. Unfortunately, I'm, I can't comment on that for confidentiality reasons, but we just, we find it to be a tremendous privilege um, and honor to, to, to work with these families and children. And so we, when we take that as a, as a huge responsibility, our fourth core value here at Canopy is our communities and our families deserve our very best and we try to honor that every single day. There's also another question about visual visual processing and I have to honestly that is outside the scope of my practice so I'm not as in tune with that um, as others. I do know that within the framework of applied behavior analysis it's absolutely vital to make sure the child is attending to whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. So we say in our clinic, there's two fundamental things that have to happen to set the stage for learning. 
One is we call it orienting, which is just a fancy word for noticing something, which we don't necessarily think of the, about that from a visual processing issue. We kind of look at it as what are the barriers to their orientation and what are the functional uh, things in the environment we can set up to motivate them to attend. Now, we don't, we don't, we're not going to try and get a child to look at us for five seconds because that's creepy, but we do want them to attend to whatever it is. If I'm trying to get them to point to the green block, I'm going to have a green block, a blue block, and a yellow block. Well, they have to attend to that. If I'm trying to get them to have a conversation, they have to attend to what I'm saying, which is more likely if they're at least looking in the general direction of my face. Not necessarily always, though. And so we would look for how do we make it more likely for them to orient and how do we remove the barriers to them effectively noticing something. So noticing something, that's the first thing, and then approaching that thing, engaging with it. A lot of times um, children with autism appear anxious and tend to want to avoid things that they're not very familiar with. And so one of the things we often have to do is kind of gradually fade things into their environment to make them more comfortable uh, with engaging with those activities. And things to, that to us seem very normal and very ordinary may be uh, very fear producing for an individual with autism. And so uh, the motivation to avoid those situations is very strong. So we have to address that. That's why we try to make the learning environment as fun as possible. Children, whether they have autism or not, who are having fun are more likely to learn than those who aren't having fun. So again, orienting, noticing something, and then engaging with something or approaching it. Those are, if you have those two things right, then a lot of other things go right with it. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. That's a very, uh, a very nice question. We have a question about how common is autism spectrum disorder. The best statistic comes from the Centers for Disease Control, and their recent one is one in every 59 live births. Now, there was a recent survey of parents that was published in a child psychiatric journal that suggested that in America, that prevalence may be one in 40. But those are survey data, and you should always be skeptical of survey data. So I tend to default to the, the, the better statistic from CDC, which is one in 59. Either way, the prevalence rate is climbing. Now, whether that's because we're better at identifying it or because there is truly an increase in autism is a question that's difficult to answer right now. So I have a question, how do I enroll my child in Canopy's clinic? Well. I'm going to give you the long way around that because unfortunately there are a lot of hoops from your ins if you're, from your insurance company that you have to go through. So one, you have to have a diagnosis and it can't just be from anybody. It has to be from one of three professionals. Developmental pediatrician, not just a pediatrician, a developmental pediatrician, um, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, or a licensed psychologist. So you have to have a diagnosis of autism from one of those three types of professionals. Then you have to have an order. And some of the companies require it to literally be written on a prescription pad from your child's primary caregiver, which is usually a pediatrician, uh, basically writing a prescription for applied behavior analysis therapy. When you have those two things, you can go to mycanopy.org and call our 1-800 number and ask for care coordination. That will, that will connect you to one of our care coordinators who will then um, either help you get plugged into one of our programs or find something that may meet the, the needs of your child uh, more appropriately. But again, mycanopy.org. And then there'll be a, a number of, of other things. We, we say in, in the field right now, we have to hurry up and wait. We're trying to fervently get kids in the program. And then once we do, it kind of grinds to a slow snail's pace because of all the insurance paperwork that has to be filed. But if you come to us with that diagnostic report and the order from your child's primary care physician, that process can go a lot faster. All right. 
We have time for one more question if anybody wants to offer up one more question. We appreciate everybody coming and participating. It's been a lot of fun and hopefully we can do a lot more of this in the future and learn more and more about how we can best serve our families and our communities. Again, my email is james.moore at mycanopy.org. I can't promise you I'll respond quickly, but I will respond. So um, again, james.moore at mycanopy.org. If you're interested in one of our programs, mycanopy.org. Um, there is an online form you can fill out, or you can call the 1-800 number listed on the website and ask for care coordination. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Again, if we can ever help you in any way, uh, just give us a ring or give us, give us an email, and we'd love to serve you and your family. Have a great day, everyone.